Hello, this is Neil Hansen. I'm a diagnostic radiologist in Omaha, Nebraska. I'm continuing the physics lecture series, which uh, we've developed here in Omaha. Uh, this lecture is the first in a series of four talks on MRI that I do. There are some other uh, lectures that will talk on MRI as well, uh, but this is a clinician's approach to the basics of MRI. We're not live, uh, so this link won't work, uh, but what I will say is uh, what I encourage people to do is in the description for the YouTube video, there is a link to a Poll Everywhere quiz or survey. I would encourage you to bring that up and dedicate uh, time to answering the questions. I embed questions within every talk to keep you engaged, working, doing stuff. You'll stay uh, better in attention if you test these concepts as we go along. I encourage you to open up that link and side by side watching this lecture to do those questions. Here's some suggested references. Uh, Huda Chapter 11 covers MRI, Bushberg Chapter 12. There's a book called MRI Made Easy, which has in the past been popular with a lot of residents um, that I've known. Physics War Machine has a very basic MRI section, uh, which is good as well. Uh, here's the Poll Everywhere link, uh, which you can type in. Uh, however, the link is actually embedded within the descriptor for the YouTube video. There's lots of additional references. MRI is very complex, uh, probably more complex physics-wise than a lot of the other concepts within diagnostic radiology. This MRI Made Easy book is good. I've read this Duke review of MRI principles. That's also great. There's also an MRI case series um, uh, that's great uh, that is through this Duke uh, MRI principles uh, book. Uh, I'd encourage you to check out whatever resource you learn best from. If you like videos, uh, the Albert Einstein Institute has created a system of videos that are just excellent. I've been through these videos. Uh, there's over 50 hours of videos, so they're very complex uh, and comprehensive. Uh, get into a lot more details than I am using now. Uh, and in fact, I would claim that, uh, again, like I am merely doing this set of lectures because we had zero other uh, volunteers from our institution. We used to have a PhD physicist do this set of lectures and just went down the rabbit hole. Uh, our residents universally said, hey, it's too much detail. It's stuff I don't need to know. I can't pick out the stuff I do need to know because it's too complex. Uh, so I was the only clinically oriented uh, physician that um, was willing to do it. So I'm not a physics expert. Very technical questions or issues you'll probably have to direct towards someone else or dig into the nitty-gritty details yourself going to other texts and resources. I do however read MRI and I can QC the basics and I did uh, pass my physics uh, exam as a diagnostic radiologist and I think I could probably go in and pass the physics exam uh, today as well, uh, the physics component of MRI for the core exam, I'm pretty confident in that. So I am confident that I could get through the basics. And I have set up numerous protocols, I've spoken with vendors, I can at least speak somewhat intelligently on the subject, or at least not look like a complete doofus. Just keep calm, I stayed at a Holiday Inn Express last night, I am qualified to teach MRI. So what are the goals of these next couple MR physics lectures? One is just to give the beginner a functional understanding of these MRI topics, to share some beginner ideas on how to think about MRI, to share resources that I found useful in the past, and to try and provide some guidance in terms of helping out for the core board exam and your preparation and studying for it. This is really, um, you know, meant to help you clinically problem solve, discuss MRI protocols with technologists, um, uh, intelligently. A lot of the MRI techs, you know, will know much more in terms about MRI physics protocol and image acquisition than you ever will or I ever will. Uh, same thing with the medical physicists in our department. But you have to be able to give them an idea of what you need and understand the limitations that they will educate you on in terms of primary image acquisition. I like to think of these lectures as like the cliff notes I remember reading the Scarlet Letter in high school, was totally lost, couldn't even understand what was going on, um, but the Cliff Notes really saved me out, and I'm hoping this maybe can save one or two people out there. So think of this as the, the Cliff Notes Scarlet Letter. It's good to review after you've learned a topic, or it's go good as just an introduction to get you aware of what different concepts you'll need to know about in greater depth. Uh, it's not a substitute uh, and all be all for anything. Uh, but hopefully it gives you a solid foundation or gives you a solid review. That's really the goal of these talks.
again, you know, I'm kind of like Homer Simpson here when it comes to my MRI knowledge. It's, uh, it's very rudimentary, but it, it gets me by. All right, MRI basics. To start off with, you have to start at, uh, you know, the hydrogen atom. So hydrogen protons have a large nuclear magnetization and are, about, and are very abundant in humans. That's why they're so useful for MRI imaging is because they can have a magnetization and there are a lot of them. When we put a human or anything with a bunch of protons in a magnetic field, those hydrogen protons line up and align in a spin up or a spin down configuration. Of note, it's not 50-50, so uh, they're always slightly more in the direction of the magnetic field than in the contralateral direction. In a magnetic field, the protons aren't still, they precess, uh, which means they just spin around uh, due to a torque effect within the magnet. So if you think about a magnet, which is frequently called B0, or some people call it Bo, you have all the hydrogen atoms uh, lining up. Some are in this direction, some are in that direction. They're not 50-50, and they're spinning around an axis. Like a lot of things, I think it's actually a little bit easier to look at in the form of a video uh, than for me to just tell you about it. Protons have a positive charge and possess a spin. Due to this, they have a magnetic field and can be seen as little bar magnets. When we put them into a strong external magnetic field, they align with it, some parallel, pointing up, some anti-parallel, pointing down. The protons do not just lie there, but precess around the magnetic field lines. And the stronger the magnetic field, the higher the precession frequency, a relationship that is mathematically described in the Larmor equation. Parallel and anti-parallel protons can cancel each other's forces out. But as there are more parallel protons on the lower energy level, pointing up, we are left with some protons, the magnetic forces of which are not cancelled. All of these protons pointing up add up their forces in the direction of the external magnetic field. And so when we put the patient in the MR magnet, he has his own magnetic field, which is longitudinal to the external field of the MR machine's magnet. Because it is longitudinal, however, it cannot be measured directly. So that cannot be measured directly is really uh, an important point because the way that we measure signal in MRI is quite complicated and it's really to the fact that we can't measure it because it's directly in that same path as the magnetic field at baseline. We have to do something to manipulate it, which is hit all those protons with a electromagnetic pulse, which we'll get into. Now, as the video kind of talked about, there's a small excess of protons going into the spin up position, plus defined as being aligned with the magnetic field orientation. The spin down alignment is at a slightly higher energy level. And this is only on the order of about four protons per million at a field strength of one Tesla. So it's very, very tiny. This is very, very, very small amounts uh, and very small changes uh, that were set up to measure and detect for MRI. A Tesla is not the fancy, fast, overpriced car that you see here. It is uh, merely an SI unit for measuring magnetic fields. Most of the time, we'll image at a field strength of 1.5 or 3 Tesla. Uh, those are the most common clinical magnet strengths. Uh, the Larmor frequency and Larmor equation. This is one of the few equations where I think that uh, residents really should just dedicate this to memory. Uh, the Larmor equation is pretty important and it's frequently tested on. It's where the frequency of uh, precession F equals the gyromagnetic gyro ratio uh, times the magnetic field strength. The Larmor frequency is just the given precession frequency, measured usually in like megahertz, of a proton in a magnetic field at a strength of B0. So at different strengths, the protons will spin at different frequencies or different fastnesses. Yes, I just said fastnesses. Uh, 
All right, uh, the Larmor uh, frequency is directly proportional to magnetic field strength. So if you have a faster, or if you have a stronger magnetic field, the protons will precess faster within it. At 0.5 Tesla, it's around 21 megahertz. One Tesla, 42 megahertz. Three Tesla, they're gonna be precessing super fast at 127 megahertz. Hertz, again, is just cycles per second. So protons have the heart, highest Larmor frequency at any given field strength, um, uh, and the higher the field strength, the higher the frequency. All right, resonance. So resonance occurs when a radio frequency electromagnetic pulse is applied and interacts with the proton's magnetization. And what is resonance? It's just where all the protons, instead of being spread apart and spinning separate, uh, come into resonance with each other and spin together. Um, so if you look here at a diagram, there's a pretty frequent, uh, frequently seen diagram uh, related to a electromagnetic pulse where everything is spinning apart at baseline. A radio frequency pulse is sent into the hydrogen atoms. They all then spin in residence together and then they slowly or sometimes rather quickly fall back into the default baseline mode which is spread apart. Um, and we can measure different things, uh, which we'll get into their T1 and T2 properties. Um, we'll measure different things about how quickly they return to being lined up or how quickly or how long they stay apart. So the RF pulse, uh, one key to it, it has to be at the Larmor frequency. And it's usually, um, you know, by definition, perpendicular to B0. Uh, we will talk about different flip angles. Uh, but, you know, uh, for baseline, I want you to think about the RF pulse being perpendicular to be zero or the magnetic field. The RF pulse causes that magnetization vector to then rotate. And uh, again, I think this is a little bit easier in a video, which I will show you right now. So here's uh, the link to the video I'm about to show. I'll tell you that this is a, a great set of videos. I would encourage everyone to go on and just watch these. Uh, this guy here has a lot of subscribers, has a lot of great videos on basic physics topics as well as other topics. Uh, so I'm citing him and encourage you to watch it. However, when we put any of us in a strong magnetic field, such as the one found in a standard MRI machine, all of these little spins or proton magnets line up. Most of them line up with the main magnetic field, while a few line up directly opposite the main magnetic field and nothing in between. What determines the orientation is the amount of energy associated with each of the individual atoms or protons. The ones with a little extra energy, possibly from some local increased heat, will line up against the main magnetic field and therefore are considered to be in a high energy state. The ones lining up with the main magnetic field are in a low energy state. These protons don't simply point with or against the main magnetic field. They actually precess, much like a spinning top as it falls to the solid surface. The rate of precession can be determined exactly by the Larmor frequency equation, which states that the rate of rotation is directly proportional to the strength of the local magnetic field. At one Tesla, the Larmor frequency of a hydrogen proton or spin is 42.58 megahertz. At two Tesla, 85.16 megahertz, and at three Tesla, 127.74 megahertz, or basically 42.58 megahertz per Tesla. This will be important when we're talking about making an image from MMR data later on. guitar riff, rift in the background. For demonstration purposes, let's move all of our precessing protons to a common origin on a 3D graph. As before, most of the protons are in a low energy state pointing in the direction of the main magnetic field. A few energetic protons are oriented against the main magnetic field in the high energy state. Even though each proton is precessing in space, if you cancel all the opposing vectors, you end up with a net magnetization pointing with the large main external magnetic field, as demonstrated in the simplified diagram on the right. This is called the longitudinal magnetization. Because it is in the same direction as the large main external magnetic field, 
It cannot be measured or detected directly and is therefore inferred. But we can change all that. Let's see what happens when we put energy into these spins or protons. Assuming our protons are sitting in a homogeneous one Tesla field, the Lauer-Moore equation states that the precession rate of these spins is 42.58 MHz. If we transmit a radio frequency pulse of exactly 42.58 MHz in the vicinity of the protons, two things happen. To make this a little easier to see, we're going to stop the precession of the protons for a moment. First, the protons will absorb that energy and flip some of the spins into the higher energy state. If we put in enough energy to push 50% of the proton population into the high state, in our case, four up and four down, you can see our longitudinal magnetization reduces to zero as the opposing magnetic forces cancel each other out. In addition, the sinusoidal radio frequency pushes the protons to synchronize and spin together. This is the resonance portion of NMR. If we add up all the magnetic moments, you can see that we now have a net magnetic force oriented horizontally or 90 degrees to the longitudinal magnetization. This is called the transverse magnetization and this magnetization can be detected with a coil or antenna. Just as a current can create a magnet, a magnet can create a current. If we have a coil of wire connected to an ammeter or current meter, and we place a magnet through the coil, we will generate an electrical current through the wire. When we pull the magnet back, the current flows in the opposite direction. If we spin the magnet, we generate a sinusoidal or alternating electrical current, the basis of a generator. Similarly, so there you go, that's the basics of how uh, MRI works, right? So we're basically taking protons, lining them off, knocking them off axis and as they change local magnetic fields we're creating a current uh, that can be measured and then based off of the magnitude and time and space of those current changes a computer can magically put a picture together uh, that's the basics of how MRI works uh, we'll get into the nitty-gritty of a bunch of the details uh, as we go along here uh, first thing to talk about is the flip angle that's the angle of how much the magnetization vector is moved a flip angle depends on the RF field strength and how long it is on. Pulse duration, so we and we can choose that, right? The machine, that's one of the machine settings. So we could flip it 90 degrees, we could flip it 180 degrees. Um, it usually comes in, like I said before, uh, perpendicular to the magnetic field, uh, and it can flip that overall signal, either you know the longitudinal magnetization, 90 degrees, 180 degrees, uh, whatever we design it to be. If you look at an RF pulse, uh, this is an example of a 90 followed by 180 degree refocusing pulse. So here's our longitudinal magnetization. Uh, we send it in at a given flip angle and we flip it down 90 degrees. So it's exactly 90 degrees perpendicular to the uh, longitudinal magnetization axis uh, originally or the magnetic field originally uh, within the magnet. Uh, and then what we do is we hit it with another pulse, 180 degrees, so then it flips 180 degrees this way. Uh, so now it's been flipped 90 and 180 degrees. And then you can flip it again uh, and again. And so there are some pulse sequences that we'll get into. Flip it over and over and over. Some just flip it once, some flip it twice. Uh, the flipping changes the, the signal that's eventually generated in terms of what parts of the body are making signal. Um, and we use it to get certain types of uh, sequences in MRI. All right, first question, which of the following is correctly matched? And you can go ahead and pause now if you need more time. The correct answer is longitudinal magnetization, uh, which is parallel to B0. Everyone now pause and say magnetization a hundred times very quickly. It's kind of difficult to do. Uh, but that was uh, correctly matched. So the, if you look here, the transverse magnetization is perpendicular. The longitudinal magnetization is, in fact, parallel to B0. And it does not depend on the given pole sequence. Those two are constants. All right, continuing on with the basics. The longitudinal magnetization uh, is the net magnetization vector, which is parallel to the magnetic field within the MRI machine, often called B0 or Bow. Uh, 
The transverse magnetization is the net magnetization perpendicular to B0, and that is usually magnetization which is induced by a radio frequency pulse. After a radio frequency pulse, protons are still precessing and spinning at that Larmor frequency, and this rotating magnetization can be detected as an induced voltage in a coil, the receiver coil, which is an expensive antenna. Frequently in practice, the device uh, used on MRI that generates the radio frequency pulse is the same electronic device that then subsequently listens for that um, induced voltage uh, and records it. So it's essentially the detector as well as the RF pulse generator. The voltage that's detected is called the free induction decay signal. The FID or free induction decay signal is a voltage that's generated um, through that transverse magnetization creation and decay. The receiver coil may be the same instrument as the transmitter, like I just said, and frequently actually is the same. All right, I'm going to show another video the same continuation on. Just as a current can create a magnet, a magnet can create a current. If we have a coil of wire connected to an ammeter or current meter, and we place a magnet through the coil, we will generate an electrical current through the wire. When we pull the magnet back, the current flows in the opposite direction. If we spin the magnet, we generate a sinusoidal or alternating electrical current, the basis of a generator. Similarly, the transverse magnetization rotates around as the protons precess and generates a small but measurable current in a regional coil of wire. This is the result we're looking for in nuclear magnetic resonance, but it's still not the whole story. After we remove the radio frequency signal, the protons will relax back into their baseline position. Again, for demonstration purposes, we'll temporarily stop the precession. The first thing that happens is the protons or spins, being all positively charged, will repel each other and move apart. As they spread apart, we lose that transverse magnetization. This process is called the T2 or spin-spin relaxation because it has to do with the interactions of the protons or spins themselves. No net energy transfer occurs with this relaxation. The other relaxation occurs as the high energy protons fall back into the low energy state. As this happens, the energy that was previously absorbed by the protons is dissipated into the surrounding tissues in the form of heat and thus involves an actual transfer of energy. As these protons fall back down to baseline, we regrow the longitudinal magnetization. This is referred to as the T1 or spin lattice relaxation because it involves the transfer of energy from the spins to the surrounding tissues or lattice. Putting this all together, a sufficient radio frequency pulse tuned to the natural precession frequency of the precessing protons is put into the tissues to flip 50% of the spins into the high energy state and cause the protons to synchronize in phase or spin together, thus moving the longitudinal magnetization 90 degrees into the transverse plane. The transverse magnetization, precessing at the resonant frequency of the local protons, produces a radio signal of the same frequency that can be detected by a coil of wires. As the energy is removed, the protons first move apart in a T2 or spin-spin relaxation, destroying the transverse magnetization, and then, through T1 or spin lattice relaxation, fall back into the lower energy state, dissipating the previously absorbed energy into the surrounding tissues in the form of heat while regrowing or restoring the original longitudinal magnetization. Because these protons in our bodies have different local environments, some associated with the free-flowing water molecules while others are fixed in position associated with the structural or energy storing molecules of protein and fat, they have characteristic differences in their T1 and T2 relaxations. We can accentuate so basically, if you just watch that video over and over and over and over again until you extend, understand every single word that that guy says, um, you'll have MRI physics down pat. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, moving on. Uh, so um, this is a figure of the voltage signal that's induced in the receiver coil versus time. So that free induction decay um, electronic um, uh, 
voltage is uh, strongest when you first uh, start listening for it. So that free induction decay voltage is very strong initially, and then as that transverse magnetization is lost, it becomes smaller and smaller and smaller and then eventually goes away. Receiver coils. So these receiver coils detect the free induction decay voltage. The closer they are to whatever you're trying to image, the better. The radio frequency coil is really just an expensive, very sensitive antenna to, uh, to listen to that free induction decay voltage, which is really quite weak compared to uh, most of the voltages that we're used to dealing with uh, for electronics, for example. Um, it's uh, oftentimes that receiver coil is the same as the transmitter coil. And to get it close, there's all sorts of different things. So you have body coils, very small wrist coils, head coils. We've got endoluminal coils for prostate MRI. We used to use a, uh, trans or a transrectal coil. Uh, there are endovaginal coils uh, for looking at the uterus. With improvements in technology, the endoluminal coils are used a lot less often now, uh, but some places still use them, especially places with older outdated magnets. Thankfully, uh, our institution has uh, very, very powerful uh, magnets and very, very good receiver coils that avoid the need to use the uh, endoluminal coils now. Those receiver coils receive the signal, digitize it, and then through a uh, series of computer magic Fourier transforms, we get a grayscale image. All right, so receiver coils, usually they're on the order of listening to a radio frequency pulse of one megahertz to one gigahertz. Smaller coils have lower noise levels. For example, a dedicated endorectal prostate uh, coil would have less noise than a generalized body coil used in the abdomen. Volume coils transmit and receive uniformly throughout a volume, for example, the head. And surface coils, uh, the signal drops off pretty rapidly uh, as the further you get from the coil, so you have to take that into account, or at least the mathematical reconstruction algorithm has to take that into account uh, when making the image. There are things called phased array coils. There are combinations of multiple aligned surface coils which are used to improve uh, uniform signal detection. Here's an example of just the myriad number of coils that there are out there. Some places uh, like big universities have coils that are very specific, like a TMJ coil looking at the temporomandibular joints, or um, you know, breast coils for breast MRI, dedicated knee, wrist, shoulder joint coils. Uh, so a lot of times institutions will have the same magnet and images from institution A will be much better than B. And you wonder, you know, why is that? They have the same magnets, shouldn't they look the same? A lot of times it has to do with the quality of the coil that they're using. A lot of places, because these coils are very expensive. So if you're in a general private practice, you might cheat and use a generalized body coil to do a number of different applications. Whereas if you're uh, academic or a large institution, you do a high MRI volume, you can justify the expense of getting these quality coils uh, dedicated to very specific things. Give, they give much better images. If you look at a knee coil uh, versus a shoulder coil, you know, they'll give you much better anatomic imaging of the joint you're looking at than just a generalized joint coil. All right, to review, uh, we got to talk about T1 and T2 in great, extreme, painful detail. All right, T1 relaxation. So when the magnet is turned on, it takes time for all those protons to line up in the longitudinal vector to their maximum magnetization level. T1 is defined as the time it takes for 63% of the magnetization to occur. It starts at time point zero. It's 63% because this is an exponential process. It happens very rapidly. If the magnet is turned off, the longitudinal magnetization then decreases back to zero with the same time constant T1. Uh, so if you think about it, uh, things with a short T1 will line up in that magnetic field, uh, longitudinal to the magnetic field direction, very rapidly if they have a short T1. If they have a long T1, like certain tissues have inherently long T1 characteristics, it's going to take a long time for the protons within that substance to line up. So different substances in our body, different tissues in our body, have different T1 lengths. Some are short, some are long. They take different amounts of time to line up within the magnetic field. 
physicists like to confuse us and uh, intimidate us with their big words. So uh, longitudinal magnetization is sometimes known as spin lattice uh, magnetization because it has to do entirely with the interactions of the proton with the magnetic field, otherwise known as the lattice. So it's the spin and the lattice interacting with each other that creates this uh, property T1. You can look at it graphically if you're a graphical person. So if you uh, have uh, you know, a radio frequency pulse come in and destroy all of the longitudinal magnetization by taking those protons and knocking them 90 degrees off axis, that longitudinal magnetization is then going to regrow according to the time constant T1, right? So you have full longitudinal magnetization at time zero, 90 degree RF pulse comes in, and then that longitudinal magnetization grows back according to time constant T1 for any given tissue. T1 again being defined as the time it takes for 63% of the maximum longitudinal magnetization to return after the magnet's turned on or after a 90 degree RF pulse, which essentially knocks it down to zero. All right, how long does full magnetization take? Pause now if you need more time. The correct answer is not going to be T1, right? Because T1 times are uh, the time it takes 63% uh, of magnetization. But in general, full magnetization takes about four times T1. So that's a good ballpark estimate. Four times T1, you're pretty much back at full longitudinal magnetization. Time for the next question. After a 90 degree RF pulse, spins lose phase coherence in a time comparable to which of the following? Pause now if you need more time. The correct answer is that after a 90 degree RF pulse, the spins will lose phase coherence in a time that is comparable to T2. So we need to talk about T2 now. We've talked about T1, which is a spin lattice interaction. Now we're going to talk about T2, which is a spin spin interaction that occurs due to interactions of the protons with their neighboring protons. So T2 relaxation. After a radio frequency pulse, free induction AK occurs, producing a detectable voltage in our coil that we have listening for it. And that is proportional to how much transverse magnetization there is. So it's maximum immediately after the RF pulse. After that pul pulse is off, um, the transverse magnetization will fairly rapidly go away and it will decay at a time constant called T2. T2, again, this is an exponential process, so it occurs rapidly and then levels off exponentially. And the T2 is arbitrarily defined as the time to decay to 37% of its original value. So if you start at time point zero, which is usually right after the radio frequency pulse, when transverse magnetization is maximum, the time it gets down to 37% of what it was at maximum is defined as T2. Again, different tissues in the body have inherently different T2 characteristics. Some have very short T2 times where that transverse magnetization goes away very rapidly. Others have long T2 times where they kind of hold on to that transverse magnetization for a relatively longer period um, and that free induction decay signal lasts longer because they're holding on to that uh, transverse magnetization. These are still very, very, very short time periods, less than a second that these are occurring. So the machine is detecting um, differences in tissues uh, that are on the order of milliseconds in terms of their T2 uh, relaxation properties. It's really kind of a miracle if you think about it. These are known as spin-spin uh, interactions or relaxation because you lose this resonance or you lose this transverse magnetization because of the spins repelling each other because they're all positively charged. This is due to interactions of protons with each other. Uh, and again, like it's on the order of tens of milliseconds. All right, here's the key. Different tissues have different T1 and T2 properties due to their inherent differences in their molecular frequencies of motion. Contrast agents cause T1 shortening. 
So contrast agents are useful because they cause inherent T1 shortening so we can manipulate a sequence to make them bright because they're T1 short. Fluid causes what's called T2 prolongation. So if we wanna look at fluid like an MRCP sequence or a T2 fat sat sequence looking for edema and inflammation, uh, we're looking at uh, things that have long T2 lives. Short T1 is defined as bright. Long T2 is defined as bright. So if you look at things that are um, long on T2, like CSF or gray matter is relatively longer, they're gonna be relatively brighter on T2 weighted imaging. If you look at T1 weighted imaging, things that are shorter bright. So CSF is not, it's very T1 long, so it's gonna be uh, dark on T1 weighted imaging. If you look at things like liver or kidney or pancreas, things that are full of protein and have relatively shorter T1 times, they're gonna be relatively brighter on T1 weighted imaging. Things uh, that have contrast in them like vessels on a post-contrast sequence are gonna be artificially shortened by the contrast, so they're gonna be very bright, in fact, the brightest things on the image. And you know there are a couple substances, and I'll highlight fat here, which has a relatively longer T2 and a relatively long, uh, shorter T1. And so they're kind of bright on everything. So on, on many T1 and T2 weighted sequences, unless we do something specifically to get rid of fat signal, fat's gonna be bright. It's one of the few things that's bright on T1 and T2 weighted images commonly. All right, next question. A patient previously underwent an MRI on a 1.5 Tesla system. His follow-up study is scheduled on a three Tesla system. Which of the following is true? Pause now if you need more time. The correct answer is the pulse sequence parameters may need to be adjusted because of RF heating limitations. So you cannot just take, I had a clinician once ask me why uh, we can't just give our MRI protocol to a small hospital that frequently refers people to us. And one, like we're imaging the, the do we do our MRCPs at three Tesla, they have a 1.5 Tesla magnet. So just inherently from the outset, it wouldn't work. Um, kind of shows uh, just kind of the inherent lack of physics knowledge uh, that a lot of uh, clinically oriented doctors have. So you can't use the identical parameters. You don't have to use a larger field of view at 3T. In fact, at 3 Tesla, a lot of times, you do a study at 3 Tesla to utilize a smaller field of view. The pull sequence parameters do need to be adjusted, so that's correct. T1 contrast properties will not change because proton T1 values are independent of field strength. That's absolutely false, right? T1 values will change if you go from 1.5 to 3T because that's a spin lattice interaction. If you change the, the lattice up to a field strength that's double baseline, the T1 properties are gonna change. All right, here's a concept. T1 time changes with the magnetic field strength. If you double the field strength, the T1 will increase on the order of two to the power of one half. So it's in, again, kind of an exponential change. Um, it's not a uh, linear relationship, so it's not double double, it's two to the one half. T2 times are independent of magnetic field strength for the most part, so T2 times don't really change if you change the magnetic field strength. We have to introduce additional things which are playing in here because uh, in our body, Things aren't uh, completely homogeneous. We're different from left to right. Uh, you know, the my body is a little bit different on the right than the left. I'm not like Brad Pitt, I'm not perfectly symmetric. My face is a little bit squished on the right. Yes, I have to admit it, it uh, makes me a little bit ugly. All right, but anyway, we have to introduce these things called T2 star. So magnetic fields are inhomogeneous. They cause slightly different Larmor frequencies. Typically, this is uh, on the order of a few parts per million or micro tesla, but adjacent magnetizations tend to diverge and dephase, which results in additional loss of signal and transverse magnetization. And this especially happens around areas where there are um, more uh, locally magnetic atoms. So specifically, I'll, I'll pick on iron. So uh, this is a, a T2 star weighted uh, type of sequence in the brain. And we 
you can easily see iron on these type of sequences. So here what we're looking at are hemorrhages in the brain. Hemorrhage, you know, has hemoglobin in it, which has iron. So it creates these little inhomogeneous magnetic fields, which cause differences in the signal detected at these areas, especially on pulse sequences, which are designed to maximize T2 star effects, which are local magnetic field inhomogeneities. What dominates? Well, T2 star uh, does not have nearly as much effect as T2 weighted properties, uh, which is, does not have as much effect as T1 weighted properties. So T1 is greater than T2 is greater than T2 star in general when we're talking about what matters for a lot of pole sequences. Pre-induction decay depends on both the T2 and the T2 star effect, uh, however. So if you wanted to calculate um, you know, free induction decay, uh, you'd have to factor in both T2 and T2 star effects because that free induction decay is somewhat modified by local field inhomogeneity or T2 star effects. Um, so, uh, you know, if you are a mathematical person and you want to calculate this out, you can uh, use this equation here and calculate things. And if you think about it, I like to think of things more conceptually myself. And I always think of T2 star as being a few milliseconds shorter than T2. So uh, those effects are going to be a few milliseconds shorter than T2. Paramagnetic and ferromagnetic agents uh, are agents that disrupt field homogeneity. We'll talk about them in more in depth in a future talk. Uh, but those paramagnetic and ferromagnetic agents shorten T2 star and uh, they can even be manipulated. Like someplace we'll use paramagnetic uh, and ferromagnetic contrast agents. Um, blood products, iron, uh, iron SPIO is a uh, agent that some people use uh, that will alter pole sequences. Dephasing by T2 star uh, can be overcome and that's by using spin echoes which we'll get into more um, in the pole sequences talk. All right, now more basics of MRI. What is the key to localize MRI signal in space? Pause now if you need more time. The key is gradient coils. So it's gonna get even more complex as we talk about gradient coils. So take a little mental health break here if you need it uh, prior to proceeding on, get a drink, go to the bathroom, or just look at pictures of my family. Uh, you know, I'd like to think of myself as pretty bright and my kids are pretty bright, uh, but they were picking up acorns and I said, hey, why on earth are you wearing helmets? And like, oh, we're worried that one of the acorns is gonna fall on our head and kill us. Okay, you know, you know, and this guy, I mean, it just looks like he's eating poop in this picture. It's just ridiculous. I don't know. Uh, you know, uh, I, again, you know, for my mental health breaks, a lot of times if I'm doing them live, I'll show pictures of people falling. And traditionally I'd show a picture, uh, you know, I went to my kid's Cub Scout leader and, uh, you know, as we're ice skating along. Uh, one time we got to uh, have an ice skating rink from nine o'clock to midnight for free. So of course we went there and did it at the YMCA. We also got to swim. Uh, it was ridiculous because I go to bed at 10 o'clock so I was exhausted. And about midnight I fell and I show a video of me smacking my elbow and literally it has hurt for like two or three years since then. I got ulnar entrapment syndrome. It's kind of ridiculous uh, how being clumsy has really been deleterious to my life. But anyway, uh, moving on. All right, so now we need to get into some even more complex topics, which would be localizing where the signal is coming from. Because right now we've only talked really about how to generate the signal and listen for the signal. We haven't really talked about how to localize the signal. So to localize the signal in space on an MRI machine, gradients in the magnetic field are applied. There's something called a slice selection gradient. This is on at the same time as the radio frequency pulse, and it determines slice in the z-plane. So MRI is always described in terms of the y, z, and x planes, and the slice selection gradient, where it is kind of from head to toe, um, is on at the, uh, the same time as the radio frequency pulse. The frequency encoding gradient, which is the x-plane gradient, uh, is the um, applied not with the RF pulse, but rather during the echo sampling and voltage detection. So if you look at the X-plane gradient or X-plane coil, that's on at the same time 
uh, that the voltage is being detected. So you'll note that both the slice selection and the frequency encoding gradients are on while we're doing something else. So they're kind of time neutral. The phase encoding gradient is not. Um, that's where the signal is coming from in the Y plane. And that's applied right before data acquisition. Uh, it's a key part of the image acquisition uh, because it's very time sensitive. Uh, it adds time to the sequence and every MRI sequence is a battle in between uh, time and uh, signal. You know, you have to spend a longer amount of time to get adequate signal to make a good picture, but people can't hold their breath forever. They can't sit still forever. So uh, phase encoding gradients are very important. And what do I mean by gradient? I mean, by gradient, I mean there are these coils that are in the X, Y, and Z plane from head to toe within the magnetic field. And these coils introduce slight differences in the magnetic field from head to toe, from left to right, from anterior to posterior. Um, it's kind of a complex uh, thing that happens, but I'm gonna go ahead and show you a video here because I think it explains it to better advantage than I can. There you go, I skipped over the part about zoogmatography for you. To show you how we make an actual MR picture, we're going to move our perspective of our spins from the side to the top and represent each grouping simply by the net magnetic field rotating around the axis. Remember that the lower more or resonant frequency of our spins is determined by the strength of the local magnetic field. When we first get into the MRI machine, a superconducting magnet creates a near homogeneous magnetic field from one side to the other that determines the strength of the MRI machine. Common systems are 1, 1.5, and 3 Tesla in strength. There are three sets of gradient magnets in the MRI used to localize locations in 3D space. The Z-axis, X-axis, and Y-axis. To select a particular slice of tissue in the body, we can turn on the set of electromagnets along the Z-axis that create a magnetic gradient from head to toe. We now put in a radio pulse with a frequency that will cause the desired area to resonate as described earlier. We have now selected our slice through the body. Because the local magnetic gradient is homogeneous, all of these net magnetic moments in the slice are in phase spinning together in sync and can't be distinguished from one another. To further localize these magnetic moments and their signal strength, we have two more gradients that we can use to isolate the source of the signals. The first gradient is called the phase encoding gradient. To demonstrate the effect, we're going to slow down our net magnetic moments. The phase encoding gradient is briefly turned on, creating a gradient along the y-axis in this particular case, resulting in the magnetic moments at the bottom of the gradient to slow down, and the ones at the top where the magnetic field is higher to speed up. The gradient is quickly turned off, and the spinning magnets return to the base frequency, spinning at the same rate, but they have now experienced a phase shift in the y-axis, which we can use to localize the spins in the y-direction. We then tune our system to focus on a particular phase in the matrix, and use our third gradient in the x-direction to definitively localize each of these signals in the selected row. This gradient again causes the spins to the right to slow down and the ones on the left to speed up. This frequency encoding gradient remains on while the signals are recorded. Now each of the signals has a unique phase and frequency which can be localized in 3D space. The whole process is repeated for each row, localizing, in this example, in the Y direction with the phase encoding gradient and in the X direction with the frequency encoding gradient until the entire matrix is complete. Each of these squares or voxels are assigned a grayscale value corresponding to the strength of the local signal. By convention, white being a strong signal and black being no signal at all. 
In this simplified example, our 4x4 matrix doesn't look like much, but a standard MRI with a 256x256 or 512x512 matrix will provide exquisite anatomic details of the body. Man, why can't that guy be in charge of uh, the physics curriculum? He seems to know what he's talking about. All right, MRI basics or review. So gradient coils are superimposed on the linear MRI gradient of B0. When the gradient is on, each magnetic field location gets its own unique, slightly different Larmor frequency, and that's how we can localize where a signal is coming from in space. It's, uh, it's an amazing concept. They, they deserve to win the Nobel Prize for coming up with it, and, uh, and people did. Uh, gradient strengths can differ uh, depending on the manufacturer. Some are like 30 millitesla at 1.5 T. A lot of times, uh, the, uh, how good a magnet is doesn't depend on whether it's 1.5 T or 3 T. It really depends on how good its gradient strengths are. And you can even get gradient upgrades both in terms of hardware and software that's utilized to make the gradients that can significantly improve your image acquisition um, when you have an MRI machine. So it's not like you always have to buy a brand new one. You can just get upgraded gradient coils or a gradient coil software. These gradients are switched on and off very rapidly on the order of microseconds, and they induce eddy currents that can lead to artifacts, which we'll get into more during the artifact lecture. All right, next question. In body imaging, frequency encoding gradients are usually in the transverse, and phase encoding gradients are in the AP direction due to which of the following? Pause now if you need more time. The correct answer is the AP direction is typically thinner, allowing for faster imaging. So if you remember, the slice and frequency encoding gradients are time neutral because we're doing other things while they're on. We're either generating an RF pulse in the case of the slice gradient, or we're listening in the case of the frequency gradient. But uh, for the phase encoding gradient, it's on all by its lonesome, so it takes a lot of time. So to speed up the overall image acquisition, if you take the thinnest direction of the patient, which is typically the AP direction, that'll make it the uh, least time constraining uh, uh, direction to measure. All right, following a 90 degree pulse in a spin echo sequence, the echo signal is measured at what time? Pause now if you need more time. The correct answer is TE, time to echo. So the time to listen for the echo of the transverse magnetization is defined as time TE. All right. So to move on, um, this is what uh, a pulse uh, sequence diagram is. And it basically takes an outline of how a pulse sequence is set up and lays it out in a, in a graph like this. Uh, these, uh, you know, once you get good at it, you'll be able to look at this uh, pulse sequence diagram and tell me what kind of a uh, sequence it is, whether it's, you know, a spin echo sequence, whether it's, uh, you know, a stir sequence, uh, whether it's an echo planar image. Uh, we'll go through that in the pulse sequences uh, lecture, but really you have to know the basics of it. So if you look at the RF pulses generated, it's generated really, you know, at the onset of the pulse sequence. In this case, it was a spin echo pulse sequence. It has a 90 degree pulse and a 180 degree pulse. The section or slice selection gradient is on at the same time as those pulse generations. The phase encoding gradient, if you look, is on all by itself. That's why it significantly adds to the overall time of the pulse sequence. The MR signal is listened for at time TE. So from the baseline to time TE, this is when we're listening for signal. And you'll notice that the signal occurs after the RF pulses have been generated to make that transverse magnetization. And as it decays down, we listen for the uh, MRI signal. At the same time as the MRI signal listening at time TE, we have the frequency encoding gradient on. So again, that's kind of time neutral because we're doing something else, i.e. listening for signal during that time period. Signal localization requires gradients 
Uh, again, slice selection achieved by having a gradient on at a specific time. Frequency encoding gradients is the read direction uh, during listening, so it's on during we, when we listen for those echoes. And the phase gradient is the location in the Y plane. Typically in body imaging, that would be the AP direction because it's time limiting, uh, so we want to have it in the thinnest direction possible. All right, we have a couple more concepts to review before we stop for today. So we have to talk about TE and TR. So the MR signal is really just echoes of that transverse magnetization as they kind of go away due to spin-spin interactions um, and the free induction decay that's introduced. Uh, TE is the time to the echo and it's under operator control. It's the initial pulse time to the echo receiving time and we can manipulate TE to get different sorts of signal. If we pick a short TE, there will be little loss of the transverse magnetization. So there'll be little T2 weighting effect. Um, so if we pick a short TE, that means little loss of the transverse magnetization. That means really it's not really T2 weighted. There's little differences in T2. Um, and we'll get into that as we talk about T1 versus T2 weighted pulse sequences. TR is the time to repeat. That's the time in between the initial pulse and the repeat. So the time to repeat is the time in between when we first start that initial RF pulse and the time where we do the whole thing over again. More on these uh, TE, TR, and manipulations to create specific sequences to come in the pulse sequences uh, talk. Of note, it's kind of hard to do things in MRI uh, longitudinally in a, in a, in a con you know, a pattern that makes sense. There's so much to talk about and it's hard to talk about all of it independent of other things. So after this, if you wanted to watch the pulse sequences talk, it may be beneficial. Um, you know, it's not the exact order that a lot of the books will do it or the review material will do it. I think it makes sense to do it that way. Uh, however, um, you know, I'll present it in, in the manner I do, which is more commonly presented in books. Um, but you might want to watch the poll sequences lecture next. I don't know. A lot of it is just a bunch of gobbledygook till you've seen it a couple times, to be honest. So here are some T1 and T2 values for human tissue. Again, CSF uh, is, uh, you know, unique in that it's going to be uh, bright on T2. Uh, you know, again, T1 short is bright. T2 long is bright. Um, so uh, when you look at things that are T1 short, that's like fat. Fat's going to be bright. Uh, you know, liver, the liver's relatively bright on T1 weighted sequences, T1 short. Things that are long, like CSF, they are not going to be bright. They're going to be dark on T1. T2 is the opposite. The longer on T2, the brighter it is. So things like CSF are bright. Fat here is relatively long compared to like other soft tissues. So it's going to be bright as well. All right. I'm not going to, going to go into the nitty gritties of T1, proton density, T2, GRE, stir flare. Not because you don't need to know it, but because we're going to be covering this in extreme detail on another talk. Uh, so just know that we can manipulate the TR, the time to repeat the sequence, and the TE, the time to listen for the echoes, and generate different sequences which are, which are weighted differently for T1 weighted properties, T2 weighted properties, and other uh, inherent properties as well. All right, now to actually the really hard part of MRI uh, physics, in my opinion, uh, talking about imagery construction. Image generation is uh, really made in terms of n pixels, which is frequency, times m pixels, which is phase, uh, and it requires a time of M times TR. What does all that gobbledygook mean? Well, if you talk about pixels, like the x-axis versus the y-axis, it's basically the frequency encoding gradient versus the phase encoding gradient, uh, as was talked about previously. So each pixel requires an individual line of data, and we repeat these pulse sequences um, every, you know, over and over and again to generate line and line and line and line of data until we've gone across the patient's entire body. All of these lines of data are acquired in a virtual space where the raw data is kept. It's a two-dimensional array of just pixel values 
uh, as you know this pixel generated this much free induction decay at this specific frequency this one did this much and where that is acquired is a theoretical space called K space K space is just the MRI raw image data if you looked at it without a mathematical reconstruction it would look like a bunch of gobbledygook like you see here in a B and C the MRI image has to be created through a complex mathematical manipulation of the raw data within K-Space called the 2D, 2D Fourier transform. There are also 3D for 3D sequences Fourier transforms. Each row undergoes a 1D transform and so if you go one row by one row that's two dimensions and if you do a 3D image acquisition that adds uh, additionally um, you know another plane so you have a 3D image reconstruction or 48 Fourier transform this is mostly magic and just remember if you don't believe in magic you will never find it so just believe that it works and it happens uh, you know there's a couple things conceptually about k-space which radiologists should really know about <clears throat> one is that uh, the center of k-space contains low spatial frequency information it contains information on large-scale structures like the con of large objects next to each other. The periphery of K-space has high spatial frequencies. It has information on fine structures, edges, and small-scale details and resolution. So center of K-space, large-scale structures, periphery of K-space, fine details, and resolution. We can manipulate how we fill K-space using different techniques um, like called propeller or radial imaging to try and make things faster. So instead of uh, acquiring the data in lines, some sequences and some MRI machines will uh, obtain the, uh, the information in kind of like a spiral pattern or a propeller pattern or in a radial pattern. And it's done uh, in some ways even incompletely where you'll do partial K-space acquisitions where through complex math only some of the the data is acquired and the other data is actually inferred. It's never actually acquired. It's just inferred from the data elsewhere, uh, which is really magical <laughs> in my opinion. Uh, but all these different manipulations of K-space, how it's acquired, whether it's acquired in a radial, propeller, or linear fashion, whether it's uh, acquired completely or partially, is done uh, to try and speed things up. Parallel imaging uh, is where uh, a bunch of different receiver coils are all lined up. So this actually uses physical properties within the uh, data receiver or the receiver coil to give you some information on space. This uh, just uses spatial information from an array of these receiver coils. Information is derived from where these receiver coils are inherently in space. Uh, and uh, so it replaces some of the work that's typically done by the gradients and specifically a lot of times it's used to replace information acquired during the phase encoding step. This really speeds up MRI acquisition. Uh, different vendors call this different things. There's image based ways to do this uh, which like Philips uses Sense is what they call it which makes multiple small field of views and just merges them together and there are also case based uh, K-space based ways to do this uh, like some other vendors like I think Siemens does this which calculates missing areas of K-space lines via a complex math reconstruction they call it smash so smashing smash um, you know different ways to do this parallel imaging parallel imaging inherently reduces your signal to noise ratio so it kind of limits how much you can do it but just remember parallel imaging uses inherent things within the receiver coils to make images faster, but you're limited on what you can do it with uh, due to the degradation of signal to noise ratio. Uh, if you think about it, you know, when you learn about CT and how a CT image is created, parallel image really does things kind of the same. So instead of just one RF coil, you have three, and they create three different images, and then they're reconstructed as a single image. So you can save information in terms of, you know, like, let's just use the phase encoding gradient being right to left. You can save time on requiring right to left information because you know that this receiver coil was to the right of this receiver coil so the information has to be to the right of the image. Uh, it's the theory behind it all. Uh, parallel imaging technology again has a bunch of different names from the different vendors so if you hear something that doesn't make uh, 
you know, intuitive sense, like sense or speeder or asset or grappler or whatever. It's just a fancy way of saying that we're using parallel MRI technology to speed things up for image acquisition. Uh, frequently, these coils will come in different arrays. There are eight channel coils, 16 channel coils, cardiac coils, since cardiac imaging has to be particularly fast due to inherent cardiac motion. They use a 32 element array. Uh, the more elements, of course, the more expensive things are. So parallel imaging just tries to replace some of that gradient coil work by providing spatial resolution and decay um, uh, phase encoding time, uh, or decrease fa phase encoding time. Uh, you have to factor in the parallel imaging factor, which is just a quantification of how fast things are speeded up by using parallel imaging. This really depends on how many elements you have, 8 versus 12 versus 32, and typically this factor at most will be 2 to 4. So you can speed things up 2 to 4 times faster. Any attempts to try and do it more really um, results in unacceptable images. Parallel imaging, since it degrades signal-to-noise ratio, it really works best with high signal-to-noise ratio systems, uh, for example, like a 3-Tesla system. All right, parallel imaging techniques employ a multi-coil receiver array. Which of the following is false? Pause now if you need more time. The correct answer is using multiple receiver coils requires a longer TR. So that is, in fact, not true. Um, you can use the same TR, have the same length, and speed things up by using multiple receiver coils. Knowledge of parallel coil geometry permits a reduction in the number of phase encoding steps needed. That's true. Parallel imaging usually requires a calibration scan. That's true. Parallel imaging permits shorter effective TE values in spin echo, fast spin echo sequences. That's also true. The only thing that's false is it does not require a longer TR. All right, I'm going to leave on this slide to set up the next talk um, or the next talks. So pulse echo or uh, um, clinically oriented pulse sequences, I think I'll probably do that one next. I'd advise you to look at that one next um, and then, uh, you know, good luck. Watch this video a couple times. If you have no idea what I'm talking about throughout this video, just realize that most people, the first one, two, maybe even three times through MRI physics don't really get it. Uh, some people will get through the whole core exam and never quite get it. They just memorize a sufficient amount of material, which I'm sure you're all excellent at doing at this point. Um, but know that, uh, you know, just keep at it. And after reviewing material, uh, you know, it may be worthwhile to watch this lecture again and just hit the highlights because uh, it might make more sense than the first time through.